Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Oh ho! Another hunter's monster tale about the one that got away. But as one might surmise, it's a little different when it's the one who thinks they're doing the hunting, being the one that ends up having to get away. Tonight's Tale of Turnabout, Prey, by John R. My story takes place in a town you've probably never heard of in southeastern rural Kentucky. It's a small town, with its people sparsely peppering the mountainsides to and fro. It's the type of town where it isn't exactly unusual to find neighbors bartering for goods with livestock, living off what the land provides, and making do with what they got. It's here that my father was raised, and it's here that he raised his family. My father was a proud man, short, barely 5'7", but stout. He was many things, a mountaineer, a carpenter, a survivor, a hunter, but mostly he was proud. He instilled in me all the virtues that I believe in today. He's the type of man that would give you the last dollar to his name. The type that would go hungry to make sure that his children were fed, and there were times that he did. I suppose I should clarify that I grew up in poverty. No doubt there were those that were worse off than me, but times were hard nonetheless. Now, Dad worked intermittently mostly in construction. Um, there were a few homes in the community that my father did not at least help with. He built our house from the ground up, dug out the basement, and leveled the land with little more than a shovel, a wheelbarrow, and the helping hands of my uncle and two older brothers. Our house sat on a hillside in a leveled alcove, and the yard stretched on for what seemed like forever, ending at a fresh mountain brook where the woodland lie beyond. He spent a lot of time in those woods, hiking trails, digging ginseng, hunting, and otherwise passing time. The mountains provided our family with many necessities. Our water was pumped from a mine near the mountain's peak, and our food consisted mainly of game and livestock. My mother is a wonderful cook. She had a fondness for for chicken which we raised. My father on the other hand, he preferred game. No stranger to the culinary arts, my father was adept at preparing a variety of dishes, all of which he tracked and killed himself. Long before the sun would rise, my father would grab his light and head out. He'd follow the mountain stream before turning off onto one of the many mine roads that littered the terrain. One such road ran by an old graveyard long since forgotten by the rest of the world. Some headstones there dated back to the onset in the 19th century. I recall one night my father decided to go spotting. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, spotting is a common practice among Appalachian hunters. The hunter will set out before sunrise taking a light, little else. The hunter will then proceed to shine the light, much like a spotlight, in hopes of catching a glimpse of an animal's eyes. You see, the eyes of an animal are luminous, and in complete darkness, when the light passes over them, they'll shine. This is a method of establishing good hunting venues. On the particular night in question, my father broke tradition and decided to take his shotgun with him on his spotting expedition. This decision, I would later learn, saved his life. It was a warm spring night. I was always a night owl, so when my father stirred, I was awake and playing my Super Nintendo. It was a school night, so I was greeted with his ever-present smile. Hey, big man. He chimed. You're up late. Oh, I, I want to beat Mario, I told him, my eyes leaving the screen long enough to see him tying on his boots. He didn't reply, just smiled and rubbed my head as he passed me on his way to the gun cabinet. Now from it, he removed his customary 12-gauge and some shells and a miner's light. The light, I recall, strapped to his head and attached to a rather large battery that he hung at his waist. 
He then made his way to the couch and sat next to me. He casually lifted the TV remote and waited. When I finished the level, he smiled. Pause it, buddy. I need to check the forecast. He told me. I obliged and he changed the channel. He watched as the forecaster rambled on about the night's weather and seemed content. Not giving rain for today. That's good. He turned to me and smiled again. Okay, you can go back to your game. I'm, I'm going out. I'll be back in a while. You tell your mother I'll bring home supper. Tonight, we're having a rabbit. He kissed my forehead and stood. I smiled at him as he rounded the hallway corner to our front door. I listened to the door shut and to the clunk of his boots as he made his way off the porch, down the steps, and through the yard. His steps faded in the distance. Now, from this point on, I can't vouch for the validity of my tale, but I can tell you that the man who returned was not the man that left. Make no mistake, my father did return, but he was changed. He never spoke much of that night until after I'd started college. This is his story. Like most other nights, he headed up the mountain via a trail that ran alongside the brook. The air was still and warm and the moon and stars shone bright. There were no clouds and the forecast was clear. The sound of cicadas and crickets filled the air. He made his way along the trail intermittently shining his light on either side of the stream. He walked along the stream until he reached a fork in the path. To his left was his customary turnoff. Farther up the trail was the old slate dump. Above that was a derelict coal chute. He shined his light along the trail and contemplated. He'd been talking with his hunting buddies and they'd mentioned that a sweet spot was near the graveyard. Warren a rabbit's head apparently taken residence near the abandoned cemetery and they all had good fortune when hunting there. My father thought on it for a moment before turning to the right. The right trail led on up the mountain to the mine where we draw our water. It passed right by the cemetery where the rabbits were said to reside. He continued to follow the stream until making his way to the cemetery. Upon his arrival, he skimmed his light back and forth across the plots. If there were a warren here, the rabbits were definitely not being very active tonight. He trudged among the plots until finally deciding to move on. He walked back to the trail and stopped. He could go back along the stream trail to the slate dump. At the very least he thought he could cover grounds that he was used to hunting. Instead, he decided to follow the trail further. He'd been walking for a little more than 15 minutes when he noticed a strange phenomenon. The light from the moon and the stars was completely gone. Clouds covered the sky and in the distance somewhere there was a flash of lightning. He counted the seconds to the thunder. The sky roared for a moment and then fell silent. There was no rain. He silently observed the surroundings, shining his light on either side of the trail. He paused for a moment longer and then trudged on. As he walked, he noticed something else. Very faintly, very rhythmically, his footsteps were echoing. Now this was unusual. If you've ever been on a wooded mountain, one thing you'll notice is that the mountains are excellent listeners and seldom repeat what they're told. It was then that the silence consumed him. The cicadas, the crickets, the owls, they were all hushed. My father stopped and shined his light around him. He saw nothing, and after a moment, he continued along the trail. The echo was silent for another moment and then started up again. With every crunch of my father's feet, he could hear another crunch simultaneously hit the trail behind him. Someone or something was following him, deliberately and furtively stalking him. He stopped again and so did his echo. He shined the light around him again in all directions, down the trail, into the trees, even into the air. Nothing. There was absolutely nothing there. He carefully observed his surroundings. It was then that he noticed another trail, not three feet from him, on the other side of the brush. Silently, he began devising a plan. He decided that he would begin walking again, and when the echo recommenced, he'd take another step, but stop. If it was his mind playing tricks on him, then the echo would stop too. He turned up the trail and continued on his way. 
Within moments, the echo re-emerged. He waited until he was confident that the time was right, and then he stepped and stopped mid-step. His foot was barely an inch from the ground. Crunch. The sound resonated through his being and sent shivers down his spine. He spun around and shined his light again, only to be greeted by the darkness. He turned back up the trail and quickened his pace. This time, the strides did not mimic his own. They were faster and louder. It dawned on my father at this point that he'd pissed it off, whatever it was. He loaded his shotgun as another plan developed in his mind. He decided to step through the brush to the trail on the other side. There he'd wait for it to pass him, and he'd turn the tides. Without hesitation, he cut off his light and stepped across the brush and waited in the darkness. The sound of its strides continued up the trail before stopping what sounded like mere feet away from him. Then it crossed through the brush, coming to a halt right beside him. His stomach sank and he fumbled for his light. He could feel its eyes burning into his skin, boring holes into his brain. The light came on with a sudden flash. Nothing. There was absolutely nothing there. He shined the light all around him. There was no sign of anything passing through the brush, no sign of anything walking along the trail. My father, an expert hunter, could find no trace of the thing that was stalking him. He shined the light further up the trail and saw something, a, a building, the old coal chute that was just above the slate dump. He bolted for it. He could hear its strides coming up fast behind him. He turned into the coal chute and dove in. The chute collapsed around him, sending him pouring down onto slate and rock. He quickly made his way to his feet and shined his light toward the chute, shotgun in firing position. He could hear it moving fast up the trail. He heard it hit the coal chute, and the chute thundered and trembled under its weight, but my father couldn't see anything. He fired blindly, pumped and fired again and again. The boom of his shotgun echoed throughout the valley, the sound matched by a roar that made the hair on his neck stand up. The chute was silent for a moment, and then he heard its strides bolt in the opposite direction. It made its way up the mountain towards the mine. He listened for a long time. Silence. He got home around noon. He was beaten up pretty badly from the fall. He never said a word. My mother attempted to console him, and he silently just looked at her. His eyes filled with dread, and his ever-present smile was gone. Not long after that, he and my mom separated. The court ordered that the house be turned over to me on my 21st birthday. I returned home to find him sitting on the porch, shotgun beside him. He'd long since erected a security fence around the property. He told me his tale. And he told me that he continued to hear it when he walked to his mother's or trimmed the hedges, mowed the lawn. He could hear it following him, ever present. It stalked him, hunted him. After my father passed, I left the house empty. It didn't feel right taking it when he had built it with his own hands from the ground up. But then I met the woman who would become my wife. We married after I graduated college, and now she's pregnant with our son. I brought my family back here to raise them where I was raised. But I write this now because I'm afraid. Each night I do a quick sweep of the property. I check the house, then I check the yard. And each night I can hear my footsteps echoing beyond the fence. Well... Not exactly the sort of inheritance one wants to receive, is it? I understand the desire to instill your values into your offspring, but at what cost? You don't want your kids to have to deal with whatever it is, do you? Stay scare, wildlings. Try to stay clear of the hunting grounds marked human, and make the most of your nights.